Hey everybody, it's that time again. Um, time for another video. Um, I have been incredibly busy this week. I haven't had a chance to do any of what I wanted to do. Um, so you'll see progress here is not really changed since last time. I was going to bring you a video of that thing on the floor there but I just have not had time to complete it. So instead, I want to get back on to the 165 and start putting a few more bits back together. In the meantime, while I'm doing it, um, I think I'll answer a few questions which have popped up in my messages from viewers um, while I'm doing it. So anyway, enough of this. Let's see... Um, Let's see where we get to. Right, I've got a bit tidied up in here, swept the floor, put a few bits and pieces away, ready to get back onto this thing. First stage is just check this braking surface. This is the actual braking surface for the um, disc brakes. That is cast into the whole trumpet housing. Doesn't need to be perfectly smooth, but it does need to be dry free of grease, free of oil, free of anything unpleasant and uh, needs to be clean. So I'm just going to give that a quick going over with a wire brush. You don't want to attack it with a grinder really but do go over it with a wire brush and we'll take it from there. recommend if you put the uh, other end of the half shaft, other end of the final drive on at this point, I would suggest you put something down there to uh, stop it from filling up with crap. Right, let's see how this goes in. Right, half shaft in. Have a look at the first brake disc. Okay, that should nicely drop down onto the splines there. And next comes the brake actuator. Right, I need to give this a clean up, get any trace of oil or grease off the braking surfaces. Actually, what brake cleaner was designed for? Okay, let's just give the other side a quick go over. And just dry it off with a clean, dry bit of paper. Right, there we go. Let's see what we can break now. Right, that's got the brake actuator in place and the first disc and when you push on the brake pedal, it pulls on this shaft, pulls those two levers there which pull the top and the bottom half of the actuator in that direction. Inside there's three ball bearings, or sometimes four, that slide up little ramps and push the two halves of the actuator apart. And when that happens, it pushes that braking surface against the disc and it pushes the other braking surface on the bottom against the other disc and it pushes all of that together squeezing the rotating elements that are attached to the or splined onto that shaft against the fixed elements which are on the uh, trumpet 
with any luck, bringing you to a stop. I say with any luck, these weren't the greatest brakes in the world. Right, got the diff lock assembly back into place. New seal on the diff lock shaft there. Um, new seal down there. New seals and bearings everywhere. So, next step is to put this back together. Now, there's only one way round this can go, so there's no worry about getting it misaligned. Right, tap the uh, diff lock into place. Next stage is getting the hole lined up so I can get the pin put back in. Yeah, I've used a taper punch to line the hole up and now just gently going to tap that pin into place. And you can see how the diff lock works when I push on the pedal. You should be able to see that. Pushing on the pedal, and every time I push, that rises up and engages those dog teeth. Right, two little screws to hold this together. Just hold that carrier plate into place, and then we'll see about lifting it up and getting the trumpet reattached. I know there's one thing that a lot of people ask is what's the difference between wet and dry brakes? Well, there isn't a lot, to be honest. They just have different friction material. They have more pads, uh, sorry, more discs, and uh, they just run in oil. It's, uh, I think you can even get a conversion kit to convert these dry discs into wet discs. Um, yeah, it's a, Pretty straightforward kit also means that you can do away with a lot of the oil seals inside and you also as a bonus get much better braking anyway right that's together uh, now the next stage is let's get the uh, dip housing ready to install I usually put a very small quantity of glue silicon around here not a huge amount you don't want it all squashing out on the inside flaking off and clogging up the oil filter screen so we've got a new gasket here let's get that off right that's that bit done get a few more bolts in there but that's the worst of it done. Yeah, I know the diff lock pedal is at the wrong angle, but that's easy to adjust. I'll fix that later. The main thing is that the diff lock now works. Anyway, won't take long to get that other side done. Um, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to get the wheels sorted out and um, we will uh, see where it takes us. Well, hopefully into doing a bit of work when it's all together, but uh, apart from that, anyway, while I'm tidying up, a couple of questions that have come up more than once. Um, where was I trained? Did I work for a Massey dealership? No, I didn't. Never worked for a Massey dealership. I was brought up with Massey tractors, that's all we had, and uh, I liked them because of that. I've repaired a lot of them over the years, but I actually worked for a Ford dealer for uh, several years, and uh, that is why I don't like Fords. Um, oh, that's interesting. Lord Mux left one of his tubs of Vaseline in here. I don't think what's been dipped in that. Next, what tools do I use? Um, well, when I first started working for a Ford dealer, 
everybody had snap-on and everybody was always losing their snap-on gear and everybody was always uh, everyone had the same red boxes and the same tools and nobody knew whose was what and they were always losing things and blaming each other so I went out and I bought Elora and uh, it's a decision I have never regretted they carry the same warranty as snap-on right, they cost close to the same but pretty well all of my sockets and uh, most of my spanners are Elora. Never broken anything in all the time I've had it. Some of it's 35 years old and uh, seen a lot of use and it's still good. In fact, I just recently bought a set of Whitworth um, combination spanners, Elora. They're exactly the same as the ones I've had for 35 years and I expect they'll last me. Plenty of time. I've got quite a lot of FACOM stuff, like FACOM, again, same warranty as Snap-on. Um, if I break anything, I just go down to my local FACOM dealer, and I've never had them, well, I've never broken anything, to be honest, but Lord Muck broke the tip off a screwdriver of mine, and I took that back, and they replaced it over the counter without even asking. Got a lot of beta stuff, which is nice. Um, I do like beta stuff. Um, and I've got a few bits of snap-on. I tend not to go for the cheaper tools because, well, I like tools. They're one of my things. So I like decent tools. But also I reckon that when you're buying tools, you have a choice. You can spend a little bit extra and only buy them once. Or you can buy the cheaper ones and throughout their lifetime replace them as they wear out, as they break, whatever. But if you're doing a lot of work, you can end up spending a lot more money on tools. Whereas if you just bought the good ones to start with, you would uh, be doing a little better. I've got some Tang stuff as well. Tang stuff's not bad. I'm quite happy with that. Um, anyway, but it's all down to personal choice. Um, I like the Elora and the Facom stuff. I find it very hard wearing, well made, nice to work with. Um, it's all down to your own personal taste, really, and how much money you've got to spend. Anyway, enough of this. I think you've all seen enough for today. Um, Again, not the video I intended to bring you, but it's a video anyway. So, uh, either watch it or you don't. It's entirely up to you. Anyway, thanks for watching if you've got this far, and uh, see you next time. Bye.